All right, today we're going to go through Acts chapter 10, and you'll learn a bit more about Peter uh, basically being shown by God that the gospel is also for the Gentiles. You see that sort of problem through the early church where they're only reaching Jews. They're only going and preaching to Jews, and even when they went out, they're only reaching the Jews only. And then, you know, God had to, Jesus came to Paul and said, oh, I'm sending you to, to be a light to the Gentiles. But also, this is where he's revealing to Peter, who is like the early leader in the early church. You remember when uh, Jesus said to Peter, you know, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So that's why, you know, Peter is often seen as, you know, even though there was the 12 apostles, he was like kind of the head apostle of them. That's why it's very important that uh, he understands that, no, they are to reach not only Jews, but Gentiles also. And then in Acts 10, we're starting to see God showing this to Peter. And it's not that they didn't know, because the Great Commission was to preach the gospel to every creature, but they weren't doing what God had commanded them. So let's split this chapter into four sections, and uh, we'll take some lessons from this, and you'll understand what's happening in this chapter if you didn't see what was going on as we read through it. So the first section is, is Cornelius sends for Peter. So Cornelius is an Italian person, right? I guess a Roman. He's a centurion. He lives in Caesarea. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So it's not all the, I guess the Roman soldiers were terrible, right? Here's one where he was a centurion. He was a, a Roman, an Italian, but yet he was one that feared God. I, I believe he was a believer. So some people, there's, there's, uh, there's question over, you know, was Cornelius a believer or not? Or was he just a devout religious man seeking the truth? I personally think he was a believer, you know, and he was praying to God because he is a believer and things like that, and he fears God, but then he has not yet necessarily heard about the things that happened in Jerusalem and all that sort of stuff. So there were believers even prior to Jesus dying and rising again that were not of the Jews, but they didn't necessarily hear about what had happened in uh, in, in, uh, in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified and all this and the, him rising again. And this is what we learn about here because when Jesus rose again from the dead, he didn't, when he rose again from the dead, he didn't appear to everyone. He appeared to a lot of people, hundreds of people, uh, mostly uh, specific witnesses. And then those witnesses went out to preach the word that he had rose again from the dead. So even though he could be saved, he could be a believer, he could be trying to serve God and praying to God here, he just hadn't heard of what Jesus had done. So there's this, like I said, this just transitionary period going on in Acts. Now, some people believe he isn't saved yet, and then this time when they, the gift of the Holy Ghost pours out upon them, they think that's when he got saved. So I'm not of that persuasion. Uh, I think I'm on the side where I think he is a saved man, and he's just now the, the, the ministry and the gift of the Holy Ghost and things like that is now going to uh, Gentile groups. Um, but for the people that believe he isn't saved, He's often used as an example against Calvinism because it's almost like, well, this unsaved person is trying to do right, trying to seek God, right? So if you're of that persuasion, he could be used as an example against Calvinism where, you know, Calvinism teaches that if you're not saved, you're not chosen, and you won't seek God, you won't try and do right, um, whereas Cornelius is, a, is an example against that. But like I said, I personally believe Cornelius was a saved man, um, you know, it says that he feared God. It says here. One that feared God, a devout man. So he's very, he's very dedicated. He's very faithful. One that feared God with all his house. Right? So you see there that he not only was a godly man himself, Cornelius, but he was a great example to all that are in his house. You know, and I hope the men of our church are like that too, are like Cornelius, where you fear God not just you, but with all your house too, that you lead by example and you also influence your family to fear God as well. Too many, uh, even Christian families these days, are matriarchal rather than patriarchal. You know, Christian homes should be patriarchal, meaning the man leads the house. The man is the one that takes responsibility for the spiritual well-being of his house as opposed to the women of the house. And, you know, we have like, you know, like black culture and ungodly cultures, and even in Christian cultures, where the woman is taking the lead, that's not right. You know, you want to be like Cornelius, right? Where he's a man that feared God with all his house. 
right? So it's not, it's not he feared God and his wife feared God with all her house, right? He feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people. So we can see here that he was very generous as well with his material possessions and prayed to God always. So you can see here that his relationship with God was not only outwardly, or what people could see, you know, with the alms giving, and he feared God with all his house, but he also had his personal relationship with God too, so that the Bible can testify, hey, he prayed to God always, right? So he had his own personal, strong, spiritual walk with God too. So we see here that Cornelius was a very faithful man in the faith, and it's a rare thing. Proverbs 20, verse 6 tells us here, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. So the Bible says here in Proverbs 20, verse 6, everyone talks up a big game. Everyone talks about how spiritual they are. talks about how much they love God. But you know what's rare? A faithful man, one that's diligent, one that's consistent, one that has that personal relationship with God, even where people are not looking. Right? So they will walk with God alone. Right? And that is what is rare. And Cornelius is one of those men. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day. So the ninth hour of the day, so the day starts at 6 o'clock. So the ninth hour of the day is about 3 p.m. An angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. I think this is a good encouragement to us that, you know, it's interesting that, you know, it's saying that Cornelius is a man of prayer. Uh, but in Acts chapter 10, you know, he's finally visited, he's visited by an angel. The angel says, Hey, your, your arms and your prayers are come up for a memorial before God. So, it shows that the things that Cornelius was doing were not unnoticed by God. You know? And I think that's a good encouragement to us that sometimes when we do, do things for God, we pray to God, we sometimes wonder, like, you know, is God taking notice? Does God know? Is he hearing my prayers? And uh, we can see here that for Cornelius, you know, no, he, he, God, uh, no, God noticed. He knows uh, that, that Cornelius was a man of good works and prayer. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplica supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Acts 10, verse 5. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner. So a tanner is somebody that tans skins, as opposed to if you think about skin tanning these days. So it's not skin tanning, it's uh, as in your own skin, but tanning uh, like the skins of animals. So this angel comes to Cornelius. Now Cornelius sends men to Joppa. If you remember in Acts 9, that's where Peter ended up, in Joppa. So he's sending these men to Joppa to call for Simon to come to him in Caesarea. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner. So again, we saw uh, last week, uh, or the week before that, how he ended up with uh, Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto him, he sent them to Joppa. So, Again here, like we saw with Paul, when Paul was approached by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he said, you're going to go to Ananias, and then Ananias is going to tell you the next steps. And remember I said to you, you know, this is like when the Bible tells us, you know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sometimes we only know what the next step is. Um, so it's the same here with, with um, Cornelius. Cornelius was approached by an angel, but he wasn't told what to do entirely by the angel. He was told to go seek out a man, go seek out Peter, and then Peter would tell him what to do. So it's a similar situation there where he had to act on what God was commanding him to do to find out more. And just like as we step and walk 
in the Christian faith. As we take one step in faith, one step in faith, you know, more and more is revealed to us on what God's will may be for our life. Psalm 37, 23. I'm going to share this verse with you. It says here, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So I always think of this verse as we walk in the Christian faith and as we take steps. We, our job is just to keep taking the next step, right? And as we walk forward, God is directing our steps. So it's the same with Cornelius here. Did Cornelius know what was going to happen? He just was told, go seek out this man and call for Simon Peter. If he did it, then he learned more. But if he, if he didn't, just take that next step. You know, he just kept wondering, but yeah, but what? You know, well, he's always worried about taking the next step and hesitant, then he doesn't find out you know, what, what God had in store for him. And, you know, we, we read later on in the chapter what he had in store for the Gentiles. He poured out the gifts of the Holy Ghost on him. So, lesson from the first section. Are you a godly example like Cornelius, a man that feared God, you know, a generous man that was faithful in all his house and had his own personal spiritual walk with God. It wasn't just an outward thing in the eyes of men, but also in his own heart and personally uh, directly with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, the second part of the chapter, we see Peter's vision. Peter's vision. So Acts 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So, he's, uh, what's the sixth hour? If the day starts at six o'clock, it's about 12 o'clock. So maybe this is why he's getting hungry. It's lunchtime, you know? <laughs> and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, right, he fell. So he's up, he's, he's up there praying, you know, he's waiting for lunch. He fell into a trance. So what is a trance? Because, you know, sometimes today people, you know, they, they talk about trances and losing control of your body and things like that. But what a trance is in the Bible is it's, it's kind of like an out-of-body experience, right? So it's like they have a trance and it's almost like they're in the spirit and they may, you know, be shown things. And, and, and Peter's not the only one that has, had it, has gone into a trance. So it's when they're praying and maybe fasting and then maybe they receive a vision and they have like this out-of-body experience. He saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. So what is, what is this vessel? So, you know, it's, maybe it's like a big bowl or something, but you can imagine in this big bowl or, you know, in this, in this big cloth, it's, it's folded. Like, you know, if you were to put something in a cloth, like, you know, kids put it in treasure and then they fold the two corners and then tie it together and then they fold the other corners and they tie it together and they can carry it. So there's this big sheet that comes down that's folded like that. That's, this is his vision. It comes, it comes down from heaven. The, the sheet is opened up, right? And inside this sheet is all these different animals, right? Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So this is what he sees. He sees this big sheet open up. There's all these animals in it. Now, there are some other men in the Bible who have had trances as well. I'll point you to Daniel um, 7. It's just, and really just anyone that's like had these visions. Sometimes they have visions, but also a tra I think a trance is specifically like they, they have a vision where they're taken out of their body. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Acts 22, we see Paul here have a trance. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. So Paul also had a trance. I think John in uh, Revelation also is having a trance when he says here, I was in the, in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. So he's in this, I think he's in this trance state where he's having like an out-of-body experience and then he has visions of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the throne 
And if you read in Revelation 4, it says, I was caught up, you know, to the throne. Because he's having this out-of-body experience where he's in heaven. He's, you know, he's walking around with the angel, that sort of thing. <laughs> so I don't think it's so much, um, you know, like, like, a, like, a, like a ghost, you know what I mean? I'm thinking it's more so just like a, a vision and an experience as opposed to your soul and spirit actually leaving your body. Because what? Because the body without the spirit is dead. So if the soul actually left the body to go wander around somewhere, what would actually happen when they're in the trance is that the body would just fall over dead. That's what I think. So I think the trance is more so just an experience and a vision that they're having that makes them feel that they are away from their body as opposed to actually being away from their body in the spirit. So let's continue this vision. There came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So, you know, as he's, he's told three times, you know, that, you know, because he's saying, rise and eat. And he's like, no, no, like I don't eat things that are common or unclean. But, you know, this is why God is insisting. There's, 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 so there's two things to learn from this vision, right? One is that these clean and unclean laws in the Old Testament are no longer, right? So in Leviticus 11, we see a lot of the, you know, I remember uh, when I went to a Bible camp once and then we had a quiz. And one of the quiz questions was, um, how, how many uh, animals are named in the Bible, right? And, and one of the uh, people in our group was one of the Bible teachers, and he knew, like, Leviticus 11 was, like, where all these different animals are mentioned because it's, like, the clean animal, the unclean animal. Um, so sometimes when I read through this chapter, it always reminds me of that experience. It's like, ugh, oh, you know? And then we ended up winning that round uh, in that question because we had, like, tons of animals written down um, that other people didn't know of this, uh, of this chapter. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So you can imagine a cloven foot, like, a, some, like, a, like an animal with a hoof. right? So it's saying, if it parts the hoof, it's cloven-footed, right? and it cheweth the cud, Right, so if you think about like a cow, like a cattle, that's the sort of animal you can eat. What's chewing the cud? Chewing the cud is when they, um, they eat their own feces again. You know, some animals, they, if they're vegetarians, they, they'll poo, and then they eat their own feces again because it's like they're digesting it again. So a lot of our animals do that, that are vegetarians. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. So there are spiritual meanings to this. Um, you know, some people believe it's, you know, it's about talking the talk and walking the walk, and it's sort of painting this picture that you know, it's unclean if you just you know, talk but don't walk the walk. Um, so there's some spiritual lessons that you can take from these things, but these laws are here just to show the difference between clean and unclean animals. Um, now, there is some wisdom here in the sense that the animals that are unclean, you know, humans have to be more careful with. But here they were outlawed from eating, right? But in the New Testament, you know, uh, these rules no longer apply. So they were temporary laws. The coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. So a lot of people eat rabbits these days, but rabbits were... You know, not allowed to be eaten, right? Because they chew the cud, but they don't divide the hoof, right? They have a paw. And the swine, so this is why a lot of people believe pigs should not be eaten, and it was an Old Testament law, you know, pigs were unclean. And, you know, that's why um, a lot of Muslims, you know, don't eat pigs because they still believe that, you know, some of these food laws should be followed. But like Peter's seeing in the vision, this is why these laws no longer apply. I mean, God is telling him, just kill and eat. You know, there's no, no clean and unclean anymore. These laws are done away. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. 
he is unclean to you. You see, because why? Because the pig has a hoof, but the pig doesn't eat its own feces again, doesn't chew the cud, because it's an omnivore, right? It eats meat and vegetables, and you have to be careful because pigs will just eat anything. And that's why, you know, there is some wisdom in the sense that pigs are not a clean animal, but you can eat them if they're raised correctly and they're fed properly. But if they're not fed properly, it can be actually dangerous to eat um, pigs, and, and really any animals if you don't uh, feed them properly, take care of them. Of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass shall you not touch. They are unclean to you. So not only is this vision in Acts chapter 10 showing us that these Old Testament laws no longer apply because if they were just eternal moral laws, God could not tell Peter to rise, slay, and eat. But Colossians 2 really uh, describes, you know, in, in, in much more assurance, you know, that these laws are no longer there. And ye being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision on your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So you see, when Jesus died and rose again, he fulfilled a lot of these Old Testament scriptures and a lot of these Old Testament ceremonial laws that are no longer. And that's why you aren't judged now based on what days you keep, and what days you keep holy and holidays, neither in meat or in drink, right? So this is a New Testament teaching, but this was something that Peter and the early Jews were struggling to let go of, right? They were struggling to let go of these things, you know? It's like they'd grown up with these, you know, things and all these things that they were doing, but God's trying to show them, no, this is like a new era now, right? This is the, the resurrection happened. Jesus fulfilled all these things. These were a shadow of things, but the real sacrifice, the real uh, things that these things pointed to was Jesus Christ. And now the Levitical priesthood is done away. Right? Galatians 3.26 For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, there's a couple of things that God is trying to show Peter here. One is that these meat and drink laws no longer apply. And that now that there is no longer this divide between Jew and Gentile. Right? So that's why he's saying, what he has cleansed, don't call common or unclean. So it's all related because now, remember, God in the earlier part of the chapter is sending Gentiles to come to Peter, right? To, to for Peter to come preach to them. Peter is still of the mindset, well, there's this distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul had to tell him off for it. He's still not eating unclean animals. So that distinction for him is still there. But that is not a teaching of the New Testament. So the lesson here is that there are no more clean and unclean laws. You know, don't be deceived into a false sense of holiness based on these redundant Old Testament laws because that teaching is still out there, you know, where people think Christians, you know, it was creeping into the Galatian church that they should be baptized. And even today, Christians will start, you know, saying, oh, you know, we shouldn't be eating pork. We shouldn't be doing these things. We shouldn't be working on the Sabbath days. And they're trying to bring you back into these laws that no longer apply in the New Testament, as we saw in Colossians. All right, so this is what God is revealing to Peter in this vision, and obviously prepping him for when he's about to go and speak to this Gentile group. So, requires three times this vision. Rise and eat. He's like, no. You know, then, then the vision stops. So now, Peter travels to Cornelius. Acts 10, 10, 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Right? So he doesn't even still fully understand what it means. Or maybe he's a bit resistant. 
to what it means, right? Based on how he holds dear to these traditions that he did before, right? The eat, eating and the drinking laws and all that. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Now while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing. And he said unto them, um, Go with them, doubting nothing. Right? So, what I want to say here was, you see, Peter was not obedient to the words of Jesus Christ in the Great Commission. Right? The Great Commission in Mark 16, 15. He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the, a lot of the early disciples were not obedient to this, right? So here, God has to set up this meeting between Jew and Gentile to say, get the Gentile to send for Peter and then to Peter say, go with them, doubting nothing, right? This is how they were resistant they were to getting the gospel out to everyone as opposed to just the Jews. Right? So the promise was not just to the Jews, but also to Gentile as well. Acts 10, 21. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye come? And they said, So you see how God has sent these people. God is saying, Go with these people. Peter is commanded of Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he's doing now. Peter, God, Jesus doesn't want him to fish anymore. He's making him a fisher of men. And yet Peter is still asking the question, why are you seeking for me? Or well, why else would God want them to go see him to preach the gospel? This is the, the problem with Peter. He's just so focused on the, you know, the traditions and those laws that he's, like, he's grown cold to reaching people outside of his immediate community. And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, and this is the people that have come to see Peter, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied accompany with him. So Peter lodges the men, you know, he, keeps the, he puts them up for a night. Tomorrow, he goes with these men from Joppa to Caesarea and also brings a company of men with him. Right? So now he's going with a group to go see these Gentiles. So these were the people that were astonished when the Holy Ghost fell on the Gentiles. And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. So a couple of things here is, one is, you know, you can see Cornelius is very excited to see Peter. You know, it's almost like, you know, somebody's coming to town and he's like gathering all the people and saying like, hey, somebody's coming to visit us. And he's, and he's uh, eagerly waiting for them. But then when he goes to, to meet Peter, look at what he does. He falls down at his feet and worships him. Now, what is Peter's immediate response? See, this is the godly response. When somebody's receiving worship, they say, like, stand up. Don't bow down to me. I'm just a man. Now, supposedly, the Catholics believe that Peter is the first pope. Now, is that how popes behave today? You know, when people bow down to popes, they're like, oh, kiss my feet, kiss my fingers, kiss my ring. You know, this is, you know, some of the popes today, if they truly believe, that Peter is the first pope, maybe they should take a leaf out of his example. That when people bow down and worship you, you say, stand up, right? Because I myself also am a man. And this is what Peter did. Peter didn't receive worship. Just like the angel in Revelation 22 didn't receive the worship uh, from John. Because, you know, sometimes even the best of us, like Cornelius, like John, can get so enthralled with somebody that we end up worshipping the man rather than God. But here, Peter rightly directs the worship towards God, just like the angel directs John to worship God. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel 
which showed me these things. So you see how like a lot of people end up, you know, you, you hear of preacher worship, you know, and the same happens with online influencers, like with, you know, Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate. They listen to these people and they're so influential to the point where they start worshipping them. They start treating them like a god. Everything they say is true. Right? Is that meant to be our mindset? No. We're meant to stand up. You know, they're also, man, make sure we worship God. Make sure we, you know, it's, it's if they're saying what God is saying, but we then worship God, not the messenger of God. Like the Muslims do too. You know, they worship the messenger of God as well. Lift him up as sinless, almost like, uh, you know, the Catholics lift up, you know, uh, Mary. And it says here, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Let's go on. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So it's like Cornelius goes to me, he's probably heard that he's in town, he's arrived with his men, goes to talk with him, Peter says, stand up, I'm, I'm a man also. And he kind of brings him to where he's gathered all the people, went in and found many that would come together. Now you would think, <coughs> sorry, that's not nice. I'll leave you hanging on that one. Now, you would think, man of God, saved person is asked to come hear words from God you know they're all eagerly waiting you know you go into this room you think you think what an opportunity to to preach to these people um, and you see this just I think this chapter sort of shows what God has to say like to, to have to show this because it's like they, they, they did not, want it. They, they had this sort of still clean, unclean, uh, you know, Jews and Gentiles. The first thing he thinks when he comes along, he says, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, right? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So you can see that, that he's like hesitant to even be in this company of people. And he even has to, in the next chapter, justify to Jesus. Be like, you went into, you know, you went into among the Gentiles. See, there's, there's this wrong mindset that is there. And this is why I think God has, why this event happened, right? And why he poured out the gift onto the Gentiles. To show to Peter, like, you shouldn't be thinking this way. Um, so Peter is so focused on redundant Old Testament laws that his heart is cold to those eager for God's word. You know, he must be uh, prompted to preach the word of God here. So it says here, Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I asked therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me. You see what I'm saying? So, so not only is he saying, hey, you know what? I, I shouldn't even be here as a Jew amongst you Gentiles. And, but I'm only coming here because God told me to come here. And I'm wondering, like, why, why have he sent for me? But you think, shouldn't he know? Shouldn't he know that he's, he's come to, to, to preach the gospel to them? That's what Jesus commanded them. So this is what I, I'm trying to show you here. That this is what's happening in Acts chapter 10. And it's, a, yeah, it's a bit disappointing. Uh, Canelia said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, Behold a man, so now Cornelius is going over what happened and why he sent for Peter, which Peter already was sort of given some of it, because when the men went to go get Peter, he was already saying, uh, you know, a man, Cornelius, received a message from an angel of God to come send for you. A man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send, therefore, to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a Tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things, that are commanded thee of God. So, like I said, what is disappointing here is that Peter is ordained a preacher of God, he's given an opportunity to preach to Gentiles, but then he's so focused on these other things that he does not take the opportunity. He has to be prompted. 
He has to ask, why, am I, why did you bring me here? And then they have to say, well, because we want to hear what God has told you to preach to us. You know? So they're like more even eager <laughs> than he is to, to share that message with them. And what I, what I think here is, obviously there's this Jew-Gentile dynamic here, but you know, this attitude happens even amongst Christians today where Christians, if they don't have an outward focus on others, if they don't have an outward focus to reach others, you know what inevitably ends up happening, and I talk about this a lot, is they start looking inwardly. They start bickering with one another. They start judging one another. And you, 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 go, you, you hear of churches that have lost that outreach mindset, like Peter has lost here, and, you know, somebody comes to their church, maybe they don't have the, the hair like you do, maybe they don't talk like you do, and maybe they don't dress like you do. Hey, is there, is there a standard of dress that I like? Yes, but I'm not going to, like, just condemn people that, you know, that, that need to be reached, that need to be influenced, that need to be welcomed. But a lot of churches these days, and some, a lot of fundamental churches, there's this holier-than-thou attitude amongst the church that they're not even welcoming to people that come to the church that are a little bit different than they are. They need to grow in their faith. And it, this situation reminds me of this, that you know, when we lose that outward focus, when we lose that soul-winning focus, when we lose that outreach where we want to reach others and we want to influence others, we start looking inward. We start becoming more, you know, too judgmental and just focusing on that. Just like Peter. He's just so focused on, oh, you know, should I be with Gentiles? You know, keeping these laws. And it wasn't even the right thing to have the right focus on. We need to have, sure, it's, these things are important, but that's not the main focus. The main focus is we need to reach people too. So, when you think less about serving others, you focus more on serving yourself. And it can happen in any organization. Like I said, when people lose sight of the greater purpose, right, more conflicts arise within that community. So, what's the lesson here? Don't be like Peter in this scenario. You know, his self-righteousness had made his heart grow cold to reaching others, right, like reaching the Gentiles. So now we see here, the last bit, Peter preaches to the Gentiles. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, what does it mean to be a respecter of persons? Because a respecter of persons doesn't mean you can't respect some people more than others, right? What does it mean to be a respecter of persons? A respecter of persons is when you, re you give respect to somebody based more on the outward appearance than on their actual character, right? So, you know, that's why in the Bible, you know, Paul talks about certain people that traveled with him and served and said, hey, and these hold, in, hold such in, in reputation, right? So it's not that, that people should not be respected over others, but they need to be respected for the right reasons. So the phrase respecter of persons, we learn more about in James chapter 2, this is what it, is the wrong type of respect for people. It says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Or if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. So what is this respecter of persons here? That's the bad outward appearance. It's just respecting people based on their material possessions, right? Whether one is rich or whether one is poor. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, so gay means the happy clothing and the, and the expensive clothing, Not, it doesn't mean homosexual in the Bible. Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and have become judges of evil thoughts? So that's a good example of what the Bible's talking about when it says, don't be a respecter of persons. So that's what it's saying. When he says, God is no respecter of persons, he's saying, see, he judges people by their character, and their actual, their good works, and their faith, not just, you know, how they look, how rich they are. You know, how capable they are, because it's like, you know, everyone has different capabilities. And that's why, you know, when God judges us in terms of our works, with the parable of the pounds and the talents, it's a very balanced way of doing it, based on what that person's given, how they've used it, what their capabilities are. That is righteous judgment. So there is a different level of respect shown to different people, 
but it's based on the right reasons, not based on the wrong reasons. Jesus said in John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Right? So it's not just on the outward appearance only, but, you know, the inward as well. So, that's, that's God. The word which God sent, so now Peter, you can see he's, he's now preaching the gospel to them. He's talking about the life of Jesus and what Jesus did and whatnot, which is uh, obviously something very familiar to us. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So you see how the word has gotten out. Right? This happened in, G uh, in Judea. And he's even saying, hey, you guys know. You guys know that this happened. And began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, look at this, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him. So you see how Jesus, when he rose again from the dead, did not appear to everyone. But he did appear, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, to above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and the dead. So you see how even when Peter is recounting like what Jesus did, the gospel, he died, he rose again, and then he says, and he commanded us, to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and the dead. So you see, even though he, sometimes you can know what the right thing to do is, it doesn't mean you're doing. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's a beautiful verse, you know, like whosoever believeth on him. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So he ends here, and he's saying here, hey, this is not just something new. He's saying to him, give all the prophets witness. And that's why the, the, you know, people have shown in the Bible that all throughout the Bible, even in the Old Testament, God's grace is being preached. You know, yes, in the Old Testament, God, the, the Old Covenant is being preached alongside the New Covenant, but the New Covenant was always there. That's why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Right? These things were always in the Old Testament as well. But Jesus, when he came, fulfilled the prophecies and was that coming Messiah that everyone was to believe on. God manifest in the flesh. So, 44 says here, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, I don't believe, I don't think this is when they got saved. You know, like, see, this is Peter, like, he's been asked to go preach to them, he goes and preaches to them the things that God has commanded to preach to them, and what is happening here is, I think God is showing Peter that this promise of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of the Holy Ghost was not only to the Jews, but were also to Gentiles as well. Because you remember when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, he said here, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. So you see how, like, they, they, and this is part given by laying on of hands as well. But see, Peter didn't lay his hands on them, right? They received it because God himself was giving the, Holy, you know, giving the gift of the Holy Ghost to them, as in, you know, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, which is why they were speaking with tongues. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, 
even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So even on the day of Pentecost when he's preaching Acts 22, he's saying it's for everyone. But in Acts chapter 10, you can see that he doesn't even want to keep company with, with Gentiles. So what I think is God is showing him here, he's, he's going to preach to Gentiles, and God is showing, no, this promise is not only for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. And God poured out the Spirit of God onto the Gentiles too, and granted them with the same gifts of the Holy Ghost that were given to the early disciples, like the gift of tongues. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Because what did he say in, in Acts chapter 2? Men and brethren, what shall we do? He's saying, well, you repent, right? Believe on Jesus Christ, be baptized, and then you get the gifts of the Holy Ghost, like they lay their hands on them. And remember, that's what happened in, uh, was it Samaria? I think it was, when Philip went to preach to them. Remember, he went and preached to them, had got them baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then the, disciples, the apostles came, laid their hands on them, gave them the gifts of the Holy Ghost. That's the normal order of things. But here, it's the, these people are saved, he's preaching them, God gives them the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now he's saying, like, well, we've got to baptize them because. How can we not baptize them when God has given them the gifts like the other people who have been baptized and received the gifts? So this is what's happening here. Right? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? See, so God is showing that promise was to the Gentiles too. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So they, you know, they ask, you know, they, they ask him, you know, stay with us, you know, probably because you know they want to learn more and Things like that. And I'm sure, you know, I'd be the same, you know. If, if an apostle came, you know, and preached and all these things happened, you'd say, like, stay with us a bit, like, you know, so we can, we can learn some more. We can ask you things and, and talk. So the last thing here is the Gentiles were also given spiritual gifts to spread the gospel. So it wasn't just for the Jews. Now, Peter here commands them to be baptized because what? The verse shows here that baptism is a command, it's not optional. Some people think baptism is an optional thing. If they feel like doing it. Yes, you have to decide whether you want to be baptized. Nobody's going to force you to be baptized. Just like nobody forces you to keep the commandments of God. No, you have the choice to sin. If somebody's not baptized, they're in sin, right? They're breaking a commandment of God, which is to be baptized. And this is why Peter is. He doesn't, he doesn't suggest that they get baptized. He says he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. This is why we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So being baptized is a commandment, right? It's, it's, a, it's one we should, we have to do to, to obey God. And it's obeying the Great Commission too. The Great Commission here, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's one of our memory verses under Soul Winning, so so I'd uh, memorize that too. So what's the lesson here in the last section? Now there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Jews are not to be elevated. Well, a lot of Christian churches these days they elevate the Jews. Oh, the Jews pray for the Jews, bless for the Jews. You know, Jews just get a free ticket into heaven when Jesus returns because all of them are just going to get just get saved even without you know having you know they, they don't have to make the decision themselves. It's almost like Calvinistic towards the Jews. No, there's no difference between Jew and Gentiles. Any Jews that are now part of God's people are the ones that believed on Jesus Christ, and Gentiles have that same privilege to believe on Jesus Christ. So, amongst the church, we should not lift up Jews, right, above other ethnicities. Just like in Australia, we shouldn't be lifting up Aboriginals, you know, above other ethnicities, you know, and they get special privileges. They get the voice, you know, in Parliament because, you know, why does this race get to, you know, sh sh you know fly their flag and have a special voice in Parliament and special constitutional amendment? You know, I thought we were meant to be all equal. Like in Jesus Christ, we're meant to be all equal. In Australia, we're meant to be all equal too. And we take part in the democratic system just like the Aboriginals do. So, you know, you can have negative racism, like when you actually do bad towards a race, but then you can have positive racism too. 
you know, where you know, people tend to treat one ethnicity of people better than others, and it's just like a positive form of racism. But we should not have racism, because there are no races. You know, we're all, you know, there's no races. We're all children of Adam and Eve, you know, and, and, and Noah's family. And, you know, uh, it's, it, there's, uh, we should be treated all the same in Australia as well. All right, so in conclusion, what are the lessons today? Are you a godly example like Cornelius? Yeah, especially you men in the church. You know, your man fears God. You know, giving of alms, have that personal relationship, make sure your house is walking in the ways of the Lord. You fear God with all your house. You know, there's no more unclean and unclean laws, so just be careful not to be deceived into keeping these Old Testament laws that are, were temporary, like the Sabbaths, the meats, the drinks, the diverse washings, things like that. You know, don't be like Peter. You know, in that scenario, remember, he's like so self-righteous, so focused on these redundant old laws and these rules and standards that he grows cold to reaching people, right? So we don't want to grow cold to reaching people, even though we still want to have high standards in our life. And the last one is, remember, there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile in Jesus, right? Because we're all in Jesus. Once we're all in Jesus, Jew and Gentile is the same, and that's the big thing that God is trying to show Peter here. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we just praise you and thank you for your greatness and your goodness to us. Uh, we thank you that salvation is not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles also. A lot of us in here are Gentiles. So we just pray and thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. We uh, thank you in his precious name. Amen.